bit more about recent developments, um, also some applications, they're intermixed a little bit in the, in the presentation, uh, that we have at our facility. So unlike previous speakers, who are not a user of the FlexRay lab, I don't have any experience with the FlexRay lab, uh, but I assume that there are some, um, some parallels between our systems um, and the FlexRay lab system uh, for reasons I will show during the presentation. Um, first of all, who do we are? Um, so we're a interdisciplinary and uh, multi-faculty consortium um, composed of three different research groups. Um, so there's two groups that are based for um, are based on applications or are uh, focused on applications. Put on the laser pointer like this might be easiest. Uh, so there's a laboratory for wood science. Uh, you've already seen the name. Uh, of Jan van den Bulke and Joris van Acker in the previous presentation. Uh, so they do a lot of, of research on wood, uh, dendrochronology um, as well, uh, etc. Then there's the group of uh, Professor Vedel Knudde, uh, Pore Scale Processes in Geomaterials. Uh, the name of the research group pretty much says it all. Uh, so they investigate the processes that go on into the pores of uh, geomaterials, uh, mainly focusing on in situ imaging. I will show also an example. Uh, of that one. And then the other group is the radiation physics group, which is uh, Professor Van Odebeek and myself. Uh, so we do fundamental CT research. Uh, we do research on new detectors, uh, for example, also the spectral detectors, looking into hyperspectral detectors, actually um, having an infinite number of energy bins, um, like the, the Medipix, uh, but also on new types of sources. Uh, we do the scanner design uh, of our systems. I'll come back to that later um, as well. Um, <clears throat> but we also do CT software development, um, both at the very beginning of the, the imaging chain, um, looking at the acquisition, uh, but also at simulation of uh, CT scans, um, going on to reconstruction and also some analysis as well. Apart from that, we also do a lot of application uh, related to research. Now, in this presentation, I will mainly focus on the activities of UGCT as a whole, less on the activities of the radiation physics research group, so I won't go into detail about the, the detector research, etc., but more on really what we do within UGCT. So what is UGCT? UGCT is a consortium of these three groups, uh, but we also act as a user facility, uh, so we have a lot of, of collaborations um, with a lot of academic groups, um, can be in anything, um, so also cultural heritage, uh, but also more industrial oriented. So you'll see a few of these uh, applications throughout the presentation. Now, in terms of valorization, um, our group is also home or was home to two spin-off companies. Uh, so one of them was Inside Matters, which was founded as InCity uh, already almost 15 years ago. Now time flies. Um, and then the other one was X-ray engineering or XRE, uh, which then created this, uh, this FlexRay system. Uh, they merged in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I didn't cross check the data, but then you will know better. Um, they merged uh, to be a new player on the market uh, for, for uh, commercial micro CT systems. A um, little bit later, uh, they merged with Tuscan uh, to form Tuscan XRE, uh, in which form they are operating now. But for more information about that, you should ask Wesley or, uh, or Denis after this, these um, presentations. So as I mentioned, uh, we do custom designed CT scanners. Uh, so we build our own CT scanners. Uh, these are our four main uh, CT scanners. I'm not going to go into detail at this stage uh, because they will be uh, elaborated on in more detail throughout the presentation. Um, but as you can see, unlike the, the flex ray system, they're not in a closed cabinet, um, so they're really open. Of course, they still emit ionizing radiation, so it's not allowed for us to walk inside. Um, they're also not standard walls uh, for that room. Those are big concrete blocks that we recovered from uh, the old activities in our, um, on our campus where there was a, um, a 15 MeV LINAC, electron LINAC. So it was enough to shield that one. 
so it's enough to shield an, an X-ray source as well. So we create these these bunkers in which we um, in which we built our systems, uh, so that we have really a lot of space, uh, really a lot of, of flexibility, especially in order to have peripheral equipment, uh, something like climatization chambers, etc. Um, a lot of peripheral equipment that we can put into these systems. Of course, if you design the systems yourself, you also have to write the control software uh, yourself. The people who have used the FlexRay system will probably recognize a little bit the user interface uh, because it's the original development that then was continued to be developed uh, by XRE and Tascan XRE, um, which of course, we still have the original branch of that code, uh, which gives us really a lot of flexibility in terms of implementing new types of detectors um, and, and also the peripheral equipment. Uh, so that offers really a lot of, um, a lot of flexibility. That flexibility was also needed to construct one of the more specific or, or special CT systems that we have, uh, which was built in collaboration with a group uh, that does micro XRF, so the XMI group of Professor Vinci. Um, and what you see here is not just a single transmission CT setup, which you see here, but also at two sides there are two XRF systems. So one confocal XRF, one XRF CT uh, system, which are then combined. So of course the control software is slightly different because instead of one X-ray source, you suddenly have three X-ray sources uh, which have to run completely independently. Uh, you have to move your sample from one stage to another stage, etc. But that was all possible within the, the framework of that software um, as well. Now, since very recently, I cannot say that we only have custom-made uh, systems anymore uh, because we also have a Tascan XRE Cortom uh, system installed last month um, at our lab. Um, this system is mostly for our industrial services, so next to our, um, our academic services or collaborations that we have. Um, we also have industrial services, mostly through the iMatch platform, uh, which you can see on, on the following link if you want more information about that one. It's actually a broader platform for industrial services, not services, not only offering CT, uh, but also other modalities. Um, but CT is one of the, the main strengths um, of, that, of that platform. Um, we will also use this system also for academic uh, collaborations as well, uh, for high throughput and things that need less, um, less configuration or, or adaptation of the systems, um, obviously. Now, for the research itself, um, we, we have, roughly speaking, of course, reality is always more complex uh, than that, but we have roughly three pillars for our research and our industrial collaborations. Uh, so the first pillar is the, the structural imaging and analysis. Um, the second one is dynamic imaging, uh, modeling and analysis, and then the third one is the multimodal imaging and analysis. Um, which I will go through the three pillars uh, separately one by one uh, to give a little bit more uh, detail about it. So the first pillar is looking at structural imaging. Um, on that we have the research focus of, of multi-scale 3D imaging um, for which we use our more, what we call our convention, more conventional systems. Uh, so that's the high energy um, CT scanner. So it's this one, it's really quite a big system. Uh, we can move the detector almost two meters away from the source, so that's quite practical for very large objects. Um, also, the object stage can carry up to 100 kilograms of objects, uh, so in principle it could even carry me, uh, not that I want a CT scan of myself in those systems, <laughs> because I'm afraid the dose would be slightly higher than on a transatlantic flight. Um, <laughs> But it's a very flexible system. It can go down to three micron uh, resolution, of course, only for small objects. Uh, but on the other side, we can do very big objects, uh, full human lungs, for example, uh, are things that we also did quite often that are not in the presentation, uh, but that we do relatively often um, 
on this system. On the other hand, and I mentioned we go multi-scale, so we also want the very high resolution. Uh, that's then the nanowood scanner. Uh, as the name insists, it's nanowood. Uh, so it was mainly built for uh, wood research, really to go to that very high resolution uh, to characterize uh, those wood species and to do the research on, on wood samples. So that system is a very special one, also has two different sources, uh, so we can choose at that system which uh, source is the most useful for a specific application. Um, and one of those two sources can, ha can go down to about 400 nanometers uh, resolution, which is still really high resolution. Uh, also has two detectors depending on whether it's a relatively heavy object or a relatively light um, object. So that's for the structural imaging, um, but also the analysis. Unfortunately, the time that you could do a CT scan of something, say, oh, I have a pretty picture, meaning I have a publication about this, those days are long gone. Uh, so you need also to have a lot more of this, this analysis and you need to say a lot about what you've, you've actually done. Um, first application I'm going to show is a little bit following uh, the previous presentation. Uh, so also um, cultural heritage, uh, but the African cultural heritage uh, from the African Museum um, in, in Brussels. Um, it's in the scope of a, of a project um, it's called Tomography of Congolese Wooden Objects, the Tokowo Project, uh, by Jan van den Bulke and then Sophie Dirks, who's a PhD student and also working in the Africa Museum. Um, and they study really a wide variety of these, these objects from the Africa Museum, um, all wooden objects uh, with a focus on the, the specific items of the wood, um, how are they made, what wood species were it, um, dating is, as was mentioned previously, very difficult on these, these tropical wood species. Um, but all that kind of um, research questions about it. The, the information I will give here was given in more detail and also with a lot more knowledge because I'm not a wood specialist, so forgive me if I make any mistakes on, on the wood aspects itself. Uh, but they were presented by Sophie quite recently uh, at a different uh, workshop. Now, these, these wooden objects, and, and Marta also mentioned it, it's difficult if you have a relatively big object, how you have to mount it so that you can still get enough resolution to get some, some interesting information about that object. And especially if you go to those tropical woods, you really need very high resolution to say something meaningful about, about the wood uh, species. Um, luckily for that, we have a very skilled uh, operator who really is good in, in mounting objects in a highly scientific way with uh, floral foam. Um, this is still extremely far away from the source to his standards. This one was slightly tighter, uh, mounted to the source. Um, not really a danger for the source, but for the statue, which is of course quite precious. Um, maybe a picture that people of the Africa Museum better don't see. Um, so no one has seen this image. Um, one of the things that was uh, mentioned after the, during the questions of the last presentations, um, these, uh, these libraries for wood identification. Uh, so this is one of them. Apparently, again, I'm not a wood specialist. Um, and this was used for to date this um, this object as well. Of course, if you have a full CT scan of that whole object, you don't see anything of, uh, of the wood species. Um, so to do an identification of this object, uh, they did a CT scan of that small top um, of the cross of this, this object. Um, and using this library, they were able to um, identified the wood species um, as being Wenge uh, wood. Now, completely different type of applications are then more industrial. Um, and in this case, it's the, the carbon fiber reinforced forced polymers. Um, of course, very important material these days, uh, windmills, airplanes to make them as light as possible. As, as most of you will know, 
the, the CT contrast is based on the difference in, in density and atomic number. And carbon inside a polymer is not the thing that, that really gives a lot of contrast. Um, but of course, it is very interesting to really see the structure of that, that carbon fiber and that those yarns of, of the carbon fibers inside um, those polymers. Um, but that is really challenging. Uh, the top one that you see here, or this, this image that you see here, uh, is made at a synchrotron. Um, so it's still relatively good in terms of, of, of quality. If you really go to a lab-based uh, CT scan of these carbon fiber reinforced polymers, it gets really, really tricky to, to <coughs> segment out the, these yarns. Um, and in the scope of a, a large, um, a large projects, which also involved the, the research group that doing the, the modeling of um, of these polymers, um, they made some some segmentation algorithms, some machine learning based um, algorithms to really segment out the yarns and to get a as close to reality as possible uh, model of the yarns of of this um, this polymer. Another application, uh, another completely different field, um, is from, from dentistry. Um, so this is actually one of the <coughs> academic collaborations. So we also have really a lot of academic groups coming to us to do the imaging, then basically find out it's quite difficult to interpret these data and, and ask for our help uh, to analyze the data and to interpret the data and to get quantitative numbers out of it. So that's one of the main challenges. How do you get from an image or 2,000 images for a single <coughs> CT scan? How do you get something out that you can put in a paper basically as the number that, that they're interested in? Um, and this is actually one of the most challenging ones uh, that we got in, in the previous years. Um, this is a slice of a human tooth which was extracted and then their idea is they want to freeze the teeth for preservation and then after a while they want to unfreeze it and then use it back. Still don't know perfectly why you would want to do that, but apparently they want to do that. But the question is then to what extent are tiny fractures in, in, the, in the tooth, especially the ones that get there while you extract it because you always get some tiny fractures then. To what extent are they being widened or, or do they grow um, those fractures? And you see here in the slice, I don't know if you can see it, for these fractures really decently here, made a small zoom in. You see they're quite small. They're basically purely partial volume effects um, in, in these fractures. And now they want to know, are these fractures growing or are they getting wider? which is of course horrible because the whole structure is just sub-voxel um, as a, well, it's, it's sub-voxel in terms of width and then the length. It's, it's very difficult to assess what, what length you could exactly go to. And actually the most fundamental problem with their question is they hope to see nothing. <laughs> so how do you try to prove that you have tried all the things you can do uh, to say that that you basically you see nothing. Um, it's again something where uh, machine learning comes in, in handy because in a sense it is a, a relatively blind thing where your uh, where your opinion as a as an operator um, is, is in a sense not not meaningful because segmentation purely grayscale segmentation uh, was of course impossible in these um, in, in these these samples. Um, so we did these um, machine learning with, with Dragonfly to identify the cracks. Uh, we tried it on a few samples um, already, uh, but now we want to start the real study itself. So it was already a very long trajectory, just going to a certain protocol uh, to have the analysis ready before they start doing uh, the real samples. And to know that you can segment out these cracks quite reliably. If you do a second scan of exactly the same sample that you get a relatively small error margin, um, etc. 
But of course, after all, you're still limited in resolution based on the discretization of your object. Um, so the few thousand pixels in, in your detector. Um, and that's why you want to go to something that looks at, at sub-voxel um, level. And that is a dark field uh, contrast. So dark field contrast is one of the, the three modalities that you get in, in many techniques like grating based interferometry. Um, so you have there the classical transmission that you see or absorption based uh, contrast. You have the phase contrast, which is the refraction of your, your x-rays. And then you have the dark field contrast. Dark field contrast is, is a technique that's based on, on small angle scattering. So where an x-ray that goes into your object doesn't really go perfectly straight on, but scatters a little bit and, and becomes wider, so to say. So reducing a little bit the visibility. You cannot really ha see one specific object with it, but you can see a multitude of, of small objects in, in your, uh, or small features in, in your objects that you're investigating. And that's what you see also here with this mouse. Two structures that are very well light highlighted are the lungs, which exist, of course, all these, these small little bubbles, and the fur of the mouse, which doesn't show at all in the absorption contrast or in the phase contrast but it shows very, very clearly uh, in that dark field contrast. So you're looking at these, these tiny features that are causing the contrast. Now, that's one thing to say, okay, I know that there are features there. There are a lot of small features at that position. You want to go one step further, and that's tunable dark field imaging. So then you can say, okay, we know that there's a lot of features, and we know pretty much in what size range uh, that they are. And for that, we use a dual phase grating. Uh, and by exchanging the distance between those two gratings, you can actually change the size um, or, or the size sensitivity to the features, uh, to specific items. Um, in collaboration with uh, the group of um, at, at Tomcat, we have implemented now um, such a dual phase grating interferometer at one of our other setups. Uh, so this is the Medusa scanner, uh, also one of the high resolution sources, but we mostly use it now for this grating interferometry research um, and also for our, um, our research on, on detectors. So you see here the X-ray source, the detector, relatively long distance, and then in between these gratings and the sample stage. Moving uh, to the second pillar, goes to the dynamic imaging. Uh, for that, we have another scanner, which is a quite specific one, which is built on a rotating gantry. So the gantry rotates around uh, the object so that you don't have to move your object, which is, of course, very useful when you have some tubes and wires, um, etc. Anything with liquid that has to be connected, um, anything that which needs extensive uh, cabling uh, that needs to be connected. And one of those applications is pharmaceutical dosage forms, basically seeing how tablets dissolve when they're being in, ingested and not just how they dissolve, but mostly how they, um, how they give away the, their active ingredient. Um, so one of my PhD students, uh, Nidofar, developed a, a flow through cell specifically for pharmaceutical dosage forms, um, investigated what the influences of the speed, because of course in pharmacy they have their standard ways of, of getting that uh, drug release uh, patterns. Those are standard procedures, but you want to match, of course, for a certain tablet, you want to match the, that, um, that drug release pattern uh, in the flow cell. Um, you want to make sure that contrast agents don't have an influence because pharmaceutical dosage forms in water, they tend to not give a lot of contrast. Uh, so you have, want to investigate that there is no influence of that one. And once you've investigated that and proven that it has no influence, you can see the water take up into, um, into the tablet, which is a measure for uh, the drug release uh, in this type of tablets. Of course, there's a lot of multiple types of, of tablets 
Um, there's the one that really dissolved. These were the ones that are matrix preserving. So basically they just release their, tab their drug, but the tablet itself remains the same as 3D printed tablet. Um, so there are different challenges imposed by different types of tablets. Usually you don't all just want to see where the liquid is, but you also want to see really the velocity of the liquid. Um, and that's one of the more recent experiments um, and, and projects of Tom Bultres from the, uh, from the geology department. Um, and he, he's doing microparticle velocimetry. So putting tiny particles into your liquid, pumping it through your, in this case, geomaterial, and then following those particles throughout um, the, the pores. Uh, so that's what you see here. You see these particles and you see them move throughout the pore space. And by tracking them frame by frame, you can say something about their velocity, uh, which you can see here. You see their velocity, their magnitude, um, and it really matches the, the expectations. So this is simulation versus the experiment, which really matches quite well. We also tested it based on simulated data set of these particles, um, and it's actually quite reliable uh, technique. Now, I'll try to go a little bit faster. Um, to, if you have the, this, this 4D imaging, one of the things is you don't want to have a 3D volume and another 3D volume, one rotation after it. So there you have to think about how can I increase the temporal resolution of, of the, these process of, of, of my visualization. Principle, you need about at least 200 degrees rotation to have a decent reconstruction. So you can say, okay, I increase my temporal resolution by just having a window shift. I do a reconstruction here. I do a next reconstruction only 50 degrees further and another one. But still you have a, a large window of about 200 degrees of data that you have to reconstruct and in which you can get um, motion artifacts. Um, so in that, I, I won't go into detail for the sake of time, um, but we have been investigating a method to really use only windows of 48 degrees, even trying to do 12 degrees, in which typically you get these um, these nasty artifacts, um, but by combining them in the reconstruction and to impose a, a TV um, minimization on it, we actually managed to get quite nice results on the increased temporal resolution, uh, which has also been quantified um, in, in this paper. And then the last pillar, um, as I said, so the multimodal imaging, so for that one, we typically use um, use this setup in which we combine then CT with um, XRF CT, where most of all the CT can be used to compensate for the self-attenuation or the self-absorption of the, the XRF inside uh, the object. And we can improve uh, the results of the XRF CT uh, based on our attenuation um, volume. I'll skip this one. So with this, I um, mostly want to say it's also a group effort. Unfortunately, it's been two years of Corona, so the group picture is horribly aged uh, by this time. So there's already quite a lot of new people. There's a lot of people that are still on this picture that are not anymore in our group. Um, we definitely need to have a new group picture quite uh, quickly. You can see all the names on our website uh, if you want, so go ahead and browse that one. Thank you for your attention.